Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the June 2023 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook of Democracy and Narrativism in China by Lenin from 1912. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting on Patreon, patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So this piece was published in Nevskaya Zvezda number 17, July 15, 1912, published here according to the text in Nevskaya Zvezda. The source is Lenin Collected Works, Progress Publishers, 1975, Moscow, Volume 18. Translated by Stepan Apresian, HTML transcription and markup by R. Simbala, and it's in the public domain at the Lenin Internet Archive within the Marxists Internet Archive, Marxists.org. Thanks as usual to MIA for hosting this and thousands of other free Marxist texts. So this piece was referenced in the most recent audiobook that we uploaded, Can the Chinese Revolution Be Called a Proletarian Revolution by Enver Hoxha. So it's a short piece. I want to read it now. For those who don't know, narratism means populism, basically. The Narodniks were a faction in Russia. This was basically a peasant political movement, as distinct from socialism, which is of the proletariat. Let's begin. The article by Sun Yat-sen, Provisional President of the Chinese Republic, which we take from the Brussels socialist newspaper, Le Peuple, is of exceptional interest to us Russians. It is said that the onlooker sees most of the game. And Sun Yat-sen is a most interesting onlooker, for he appears to be wholly uninformed about Russia, despite his European education. And now, quite independently of Russia, of Russian experience and Russian literature, this enlightened spokesman of militant and victorious Chinese democracy, which has won a republic, poses purely Russian questions. A progressive Chinese democrat, he argues exactly like a Russian. His similarity to a Russian Narodnik is so great that it goes as far as a complete identity of fundamental ideas and of many individual expressions. Just want to comment here, I mentioned Narodniks before, but talking about democracy, Lenin is talking about capitalism, bourgeois democracy. At this time, Russia was between its two major revolutions, 1905 and 1917. Remember, this is 1912. So in 1905, there were major incursions against the Tsar and Tsarism. There were democratic concessions won. These were led by the bourgeoisie because they wanted to set up capitalism and the feudalism that had mostly been overthrown but was still sort of ruling in decay and in remnants uh, was in the way of the system that they needed to set up in society in order to run capitalism and expand it. So after the 1905 uprisings, which again, led by the bourgeoisie, they had money and, you know, were well positioned to do that. But also there was a lot of proletarian and peasant outcry. Of course, the bourgeoisie would not have been successful without trying to ride the waves of unrest of the lower classes. Well, after this uprising, there was a parliament set up, which at first was purely advisory, then gained some real power etc. So there were reforms after the 1905 to 1907 period, then a period of counter-reaction when the freedom movement kind of slumped. Then in 1917, several years into World War I, in February of 1917, the Tsar was deposed. Then a provisional government led by the capitalist parties was put into place. As that was getting set up, the Bolsheviks outmaneuvered it with some help from the left SRs and some other people. And about nine months later in all, they had the socialist revolution at the end of that year. So in 1912, China was in a somewhat similar position with Chinese feudalism being overthrown in 1911. And then there was kind of a lot of chaos. Different regions of China were in different situations. The coastal cities were in one situation. The north and west was kind of ruled by warlords, etc. But major revolutionary social change was afoot. There was a changing in who was the ruling class. And so here, Lenin is saying that the Chinese Democrats who are emerging in sort of the tail end of feudalism sound a lot like the Russians. All right, continuing. The onlooker sees most of the game, the platform of the great Chinese democracy, for that is what Sun Yat-sen's article represents, impels us and provides us with a convenient occasion to examine anew in the light of recent world events, the relation between democracy and narratism in modern bourgeois revolutions in Asia. This is one of the most serious questions confronting Russia in the revolutionary epoch, which began in 1905. And it confronts not only Russia, but the whole of Asia, as will be seen from the platform of the provisional president of the Chinese Republic. 
particularly when this platform is compared with the revolutionary developments in Russia, Turkey, Persia, and China. In very many and very essential respects, Russia is undoubtedly an Asian country, and what's more, one of the most benighted, medieval, and shamefully backward of Asian countries. Beginning with its distant and lone forerunner, the noble Herzen, and continuing right up to its mass representatives, the members of the Peasant Union of 1905, and the Trudovic deputies to the first three Dumas of 1906 to 12, Russian bourgeois democracy has had a Narodnik coloring. Bourgeois democracy in China, as we now see, has the same Narodnik coloring. Let us now consider, with Sun Yat-sen as an example, the, quote, social significance of the ideas generated by the deep-going revolutionary movement of the hundreds of millions who are finally being drawn into the stream of world capitalist civilization. Every line of Sun Yat-sen's platform breathes a spirit of militant and sincere democracy. It reveals a thorough understanding of the inadequacy of a, quote, racial revolution. There is not a trace in it of indifference to political issues or even of underestimation of political liberty or of the idea that Chinese, quote, social reform, Chinese constitutional reforms, etc., could be compatible with Chinese autocracy. It stands for complete democracy and the demand for a republic. It squarely poses the question of the condition of the masses, of the mass struggle. It expresses warm sympathy for the toiling and exploited people, faith in their strength, and in the justice of their cause. Before us is the truly great ideology of a truly great people, capable not only of lamenting its age-long slavery and dreaming of liberty and equality, but of fighting the age-long oppressors of China. One is naturally inclined to compare the provisional president of the republic in benighted, inert Asiatic China with the presidents of various republics in Europe and America, in countries of advanced culture. The presidents in those republics are all businessmen, agents or puppets of a bourgeoisie rotten to the core and besmirched from head to foot with mud and blood, not the blood of padishahs and emperors, but the blood of striking workers shot down in the name of progress and civilization. In those countries, the presidents represent the bourgeoisie, which long ago renounced all the ideals of its youth, has thoroughly prostituted itself, sold itself body and soul to the millionaires and multimillionaires, to the feudal lords turned bourgeois, etc. Comment here, we want to as always, draw the distinction between early rising capitalism, which Marxists recognize as a progressive force as it helps to clear out the old order of feudalism and lay the groundwork for the new society. However, once it's done with this, quote, freedom fighting, which it, you know, touts heavily, all it's really trying to do is set itself up to have that freedom and to deny it to the other classes, which it needs to proletarianize so that it can extract surplus value from them. Now, obviously, that proletariat we Marxists recognize as the ultimate inheritors of this whole system. The capitalists proletarianize the overwhelming majority of society. In the United States today, 90 plus percent of the population is proletarian. We have no interest in private property. We literally own none. We don't want to see the system continue. And ultimately, with enough class consciousness and experience, we will organize to end capitalism and usher in a new system. Capitalists, of course, will struggle back for their class interests, trying to hang on to the system which has enriched them so greatly. And so they set up every kind of fascist nightmare trying to block us and hang on to power. So the difference between rising capitalism, a progressive force against feudalism, and later capitalism as it consolidates into monopolies, finance capital, the military-industrial complex, in a word, imperialism. Again, that later stage represents fascism and decay, which is the only place where it can end up due to capitalism's nature over time to become consolidated. This is just the logic of running private property the way that they do. So when Lenin talks about the advanced capitalist countries of Europe and America in which the, quote, presidents represent the bourgeoisie, which long ago renounced all the ideals of its youth. That's what he's talking about. Continuing. In China, the Asiatic provisional president of the republic is a revolutionary democrat, endowed with the nobility and heroism of a class that's rising, not declining. A class that does not dread the future, but believes in it and fights for it selflessly. A class that does not cling to maintenance and restoration of the past in order to safeguard its privileges, but hates the past, and knows how to cast off its dead and stifling decay. Does that mean, then, that the materialist West has hopelessly decayed, and that the light shines only from the mystic religious East? No, quite the opposite. It means that the East has definitely taken the Western path, 
that new hundreds of millions of people will, from now on, share in the struggle for the ideals which the West has already worked out for itself. What has decayed is the Western bourgeoisie, which is already confronted by its gravedigger, the proletariat. But in Asia, there is still a bourgeoisie capable of championing sincere, militant, consistent democracy, a worthy comrade of France's great men of the Enlightenment and great leaders of the close of the 18th century. The chief representative, or the chief social bulwark of this Asian bourgeoisie that's still capable of supporting a historically progressive cause, is the peasant. And side by side with him, there already exists a liberal bourgeoisie whose leaders, men like Yuan Shikai, are above all capable of treachery. Yesterday they feared the emperor and cringed before him. Then they betrayed him when they saw the strength and sensed the victory of the revolutionary democracy. And tomorrow they will betray the Democrats to make a deal with some old or new, quote, constitutional emperor. The real emancipation of the Chinese people from age-long slavery would be impossible without the great, sincerely democratic enthusiasm which is rousing the working masses and making them capable of miracles, and which is evident from every sentence of Sun Yat-sen's platform. But the Chinese Narodnik combines this ideology of militant democracy firstly with socialist dreams, with hopes of China avoiding the capitalist path, of preventing capitalism, and secondly with a plan for, and advocacy of, radical agrarian reform. It is these two last ideological and political trends that constitute the element which forms narratism, narratism in the specific sense of that term, as distinct from democracy, as a supplement to democracy. What is the origin and significance of these trends? Had it not been for the immense spiritual and revolutionary upsurge of the masses, the Chinese democracy would have been unable to overthrow the old order and establish the republic. Such an upsurge presupposes and evokes the most sincere sympathy for the condition of the working masses and the bitterest hatred for their oppressors and exploiters. And in Europe and America, from which the progressive Chinese, all the Chinese who have experienced this upsurge, have borrowed their ideas of liberation, emancipation from the bourgeoisie, i.e. socialism, is the immediate task. This is bound to arouse sympathy for socialism among Chinese Democrats, and is the source of their subjective socialism. They are subjectively socialists because they are opposed to oppression and exploitation of the masses. But the objective conditions of China, a backward, agricultural, semi-feudal country numbering nearly 500 million people, place on the order of the day only one specific, historically distinctive form of this oppression and exploitation, namely feudalism. Feudalism was based on the predominance of agriculture and the natural economy. The source of the feudal exploitation of the Chinese peasant was his attachment to the land in some form. The political exponents of this exploitation were the feudal lords, all together and individually, with the emperor as the head of the whole system. But it appears that out of the subjectively socialist ideas and programs of the Chinese Democrat, there emerges, in fact, a program for, quote, changing all the juridical foundations of, quote, immovable property alone, a program for the abolition of feudal exploitation alone. That is the essence of Sun Yat-sen's narratism, of his progressive, militant, revolutionary program for bourgeois democratic agrarian reform, and of his quasi-socialist theory. From the point of view of doctrine, this theory is that of a petty bourgeois, quote, socialist reactionary, for the idea that capitalism can be, quote, prevented in China, and that a, quote, social revolution there will be made easier by the country's backwardness, and so on, is altogether reactionary. And Sun Yat-sen himself, with inimitable, one might say virginal naivete, smashes his reactionary Narodnik theory by admitting what reality forces him to admit, namely that, quote, China is on the eve of a gigantic industrial, i.e. capitalist, development, that in China, quote, trade, i.e. capitalism, will develop to an enormous extent, that, quote, in 50 years we shall have many Shanghais, i.e. huge centers of capitalist wealth and proletarian need and poverty, comment, because remember large cities do represent the inequality of capitalism, the skyscrapers and so on are capital sinks, and the surrounding slums are full of proletarians, propertyless wage workers, in conditions of dire want, looking for wage work, many of them having been driven out of the rural areas into the urban areas in search of wage work. Continuing, but the question arises, does Sun Yat-sen, on the basis of his reactionary economic theory, uphold an actually reactionary agrarian program? That's the crux of the matter, its most interesting point, and one on which curtailed and emasculated liberal quasi-Marxism is 
often at a loss. The fact of the matter is that he does not. The dialectics of the social relations in China reveals itself precisely in the fact that, while sincerely sympathizing with socialism in Europe, the Chinese Democrats have transformed it into a reactionary theory, and on the basis of this reactionary theory of, quote, preventing capitalism, are championing a purely capitalist, a maximum capitalist, agrarian program. Indeed, what does the, quote, economic revolution, of which Sun Yat-sen talks so pompously and obscurely at the beginning of his article, amount to? It amounts to the transfer of rent to the state, i.e. land nationalization, by some sort of single tax along Henry George lines. There's absolutely nothing else that is real in the, quote, economic revolution proposed and advocated by Sun Yat-sen. The difference between the value of land in some remote peasant area and in Shanghai is the difference in the rate of rent. The value of land is capitalized rent. To make the enhanced value of land the, quote, property of the people means transferring the rent, i.e. land ownership, to the state, or in other words, nationalizing the land. Is such a reform possible within the framework of capitalism? It is not only possible, but it represents the purest, most consistent, and ideally perfect capitalism. Marx pointed this out in The Poverty of Philosophy. He proved it in detail in Volume 3 of Capital, and developed it with particular clarity in his controversy with Rodbertus in Theories of Surplus Value. Land nationalization makes it possible to abolish absolute rent, leaving only differential rent. According to Marx's theory, land nationalization means a maximum elimination of medieval monopolies and medieval relations in agriculture, maximum freedom in buying and selling land, and maximum facilities for agriculture to adapt itself to the market. The irony of history is that narratism, under the guise of combating capitalism in agriculture, champions an agrarian program that, if fully carried out, would mean the most rapid development of capitalism in agriculture. What economic necessity is behind the spread of the most progressive bourgeois democratic agrarian programs in one of the most backward peasant countries of Asia? It is the necessity of destroying feudalism in all its forms and manifestations. The more China lagged behind Europe and Japan, the more it was threatened with fragmentation and national disintegration. It could be, quote, renovated only by the heroism of the revolutionary masses, a heroism capable of creating a Chinese republic in the sphere of politics, and of ensuring, through land nationalization, the most rapid capitalist progress in the sphere of agriculture. Whether and to what extent this will succeed is another question. In their bourgeois revolutions, various countries achieve various degrees of political and agrarian democracy, and in the most diverse combinations. The decisive factors will be the international situation and the alignment of the social forces in China. The emperor will certainly try to unite the feudal lords, the bureaucracy, and the clergy in an attempt at restoration. Yuan Shikai, who represents a bourgeoisie that has only just changed from liberal monarchist to liberal republican, but for how long, will pursue a policy of maneuvering between monarchy and revolution. The revolutionary bourgeois democracy, represented by Sun Yat-sen, is correct in seeking ways and means of renovating China through maximum development of the initiative, determination, and boldness of the peasant masses in the matter of political and agrarian reforms. Lastly, the Chinese proletariat will increase as the number of Shanghais increases. It will probably form some kind of Chinese social democratic labor party. Comment, this is what Marxism was called at that time, the break between what we today call reformist social democracy and Marxist communism had not yet occurred, continuing, which, while criticizing the petty bourgeois utopias and reactionary views of Sun Yat-sen, will certainly take care to single out, defend, and develop the revolutionary democratic core of his political and agrarian program. So that's the end of the audiobook. And as I mentioned, this was referenced in the last longer audiobook that we put up, the Hoja work, can the Chinese Revolution be called a proletarian revolution? I want to quote the part of that that refers to this article and then just check in now that we've read the whole thing. Quote, Lenin and the Comintern, Communist International, the October Revolution and the experience of the Soviet Union had opened this road to the Communist Party of China. Specifically, this road was the political, educational awakening of the countryside and agrarian reform. Lenin had written a series of articles about China, 
the article, which bears the title Democracy and Narrativism in China, which was published on the 15th of July, 1912, is interesting. There, Lenin analyzes the situation in China, the revolution of 1911. He recognized the progressive character of Sun Yat-sen's ideas, despite the limitations of his revolutionary bourgeois democratic doctrine. The bourgeois democratic revolution, led by the Kuomintang, seemed to Lenin of special interest because of the fact that it fought against oppression by the Western states and prevented the partitioning of the country and the national dismemberment with which China was threatened. He recognized the important role which was reserved to the peasantry, while always raising the question of its revolutionary value in the absence of a proletariat in China. But in Pravda, the 8th of November 1912, amongst other things, Lenin wrote about the peasantry, quote, whether the peasants who are not led by a proletarian party will be able to retain their democratic positions against the liberals, who are only waiting for an opportunity to shift to the right, will be seen in the near future, unquote. Lenin was fully convinced that the proletariat would be created in China and stressed, and this comes again from the article we just read, quote, lastly, the Chinese proletariat will increase as the number of Shanghai's increases. It will probably form some kind of Chinese Social Democratic Labor Party, which, while criticizing the petty bourgeois utopias and reactionary views of Sun Yat-sen, will certainly take care to single out, defend, and develop the revolutionary democratic core of his political and agrarian program." Unquote. These two articles are sufficient to show how clearly Lenin defined the tasks that awaited solution by the Communist Party of China. Hoja continues, At the Second Congress of the Comintern, which was held from July 19 to August 7, 1920, the theses on the national and colonial question, according to the teachings of Lenin, a large number of which referred to China too, were adopted. The Congress approved the thesis that, quote, the revolution in China and other colonial countries must have a program which permits the inclusion of bourgeois reforms and especially the agrarian reform, but stressed that the leadership of the revolution must not be handed over to the democratic bourgeoisie. On the contrary, say the decisions of the Congress, the party of the proletariat must direct a strong and systematic propaganda in favor of Soviets and organize the Soviets of workers and peasants as quickly as possible. Soviet means council. This was the general line of the Comintern, which should have been followed by the party in China, too. We can say that in general, the Communist Party did not properly carry out this role in the situation, which had been created in China, in a studied and systematic manner, seen from the angle of scientific socialism. On this question, there were different tendencies in that small party, which called itself the Communist Party of China, tendencies which have never permitted a correct Marxist-Leninist line to be established or Marxist-Leninist thought and action to guide it. Okay, now we've put the quotation from Hoja of this article into context and read the whole article. Hoja was, of course, arguing that the restoration of capitalism in the late 70s under Deng Xiaoping was actually a long time coming, and it stemmed from theoretical errors, misunderstandings, and just never really developing proper Marxism-Leninism in China. Or actually, as he put it, these initial tendencies which were displayed many times among the main leaders of the party were frequently leftist, sometimes right opportunist, sometimes centrist, going as far as anarchist, Trotskyite, bourgeois, and marked chauvinist and racist views. Even later, these tendencies remained as one of the distinctive characteristics of the Communist Party of China, which Mao Zedong and his group eventually led. We're going to end it there. Of course, if you're interested in that longer work exploring China's development and the development of the Communist Party of China by Hoja, check out the audiobook. Can the Chinese Revolution be called a proletarian revolution? What do you think? Leave a question or comment below. We'll leave it there for now. Otherwise, thanks for listening, and thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can support for as little as $2 a month or more, whatever you see fit. Every donation is encouraging and allows me to spend a lot more time on the channel than I'd be able to do without it. This is a non-commercial channel. We don't do ads. We don't do sponsorships. Uh, I don't believe that that has any place in communist educational work. So that volunteer-given support is greatly appreciated. Beyond that, whether you're a patron or not, engagement counts. Like, share, subscribe, and leave a comment, even if it's just thanks or good video. I do moderate the comments, so you're not going to get dogpiled. So don't fear that like you can fear it on most other channels, which let right-wingers and people of bad faith just run amok. We don't do that here at S4A. And then finally, remember that the class struggle occurs in real life, not just in online comment sections, or primarily not. 
in online comment sections. So what we're doing here with this broad-based agitational and educational work is trying to prepare you to do work in an actual party, to go out, join the left, maybe a Marxist study group if you can find a good one, because ultimately that's what this is all about. This is not just infotainment. We are trying to get people ready to and aware of the need to do that real world struggle, whether it's forming labor unions, tenant unions, political parties, other sorts of community organizing. We really need to rebuild, particularly in the United States, where I am and most of the audience of this channel is, we need to rebuild the basis of class organizations for mass action, class struggle. We really need to bring that back on the upswing. We see the labor movement, for example, starting to tick up in numbers. We want to encourage that both by the formation of additional unions and by support, increasing the militancy and success and revolutionary character of those unions as they grow in numbers. So there is a lot of work to be done. And as soon as you feel like you have enough of a basic handle on the Marxist theory and the big ideas of socialism and communism, do get out there, network with people, let them get to know you, get to know them. We can't improve the left if we don't interact with it engage in some kind of constructive discourse that gets us all raising the baseline, raising the bar, improving the left, and making us more capable of taking on the fight against capital. Thanks again, and we'll see you in the next video.